So my name is Cody Lindley. Um, has anybody heard of Thickbox? A script called Thickbox? Okay, so back in 2006, 2007, I wrote a script called Thickbox, um, originally written with Prototype.js. Eventually, I started talking to the creator of jQuery and used jQuery. Um, wrote that script, Thickbox, became one of the founding members of the jQuery project and have been doing JavaScript development pretty much since then as my focus. Um, you can find out more about me at CodyLindley.com, my Twitter handler, things like that. Come on, you guys. Now, when most people give a presentation, they wait to give their slides until afterwards, and that doesn't seem like a very modern thing to do to me. So you guys can follow along with my slides. There's lots of links in my slides. There's lots of code examples. I actually build these slides so that you guys can go back and look at the code and, and work with it yourself. So if anybody wants to open up the slides, <coughs> that's the URL. Take a picture of it. Open it up on your laptop. You can have the slides right now. So we're here to talk about Kendo UI building blocks. Oh, sorry. Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. There's a session on native script that's going on at the same time. Can you just quickly talk what, what's the difference between this and native script? Yeah, so this is about Kendo UI. Kendo UI is a JavaScript framework uh, for widgets. A native script is JavaScript for doing cross-platform uh, mobile development. Is it similar target? Uh, it, it's JavaScript. Uh, native script's more of a compile time for native apps. This is JavaScript widgets for building web applications. Does that help? Yeah, OK. Everybody good? All right, awesome. So we're here to talk about Kendo UI building blocks. And really, before I actually get into the building blocks, and there's only three, I'm trying to keep it really simple, I've got to lay a foundation for you guys. Um, I've got to sort of cover the basics of what Kendo UI is. So as I, as I was just telling this gentleman here, if you're not aware, Kendo UI, they're just a set of JavaScript widgets that run on the web platform, in a web browser, on your phone, on a desktop, in a tablet. So hopefully um, you understand they're just a set of widgets. They do have some web application sugar that you can wrap around them. But in order to sort of build that foundation, what I want to do is I want to go through six instantiation patterns of how you create these widgets. Now, the first two are, are imperative instantiation patterns. And hopefully, hopefully most of you guys are comfortable with that term. Uh, the first two we're going to cover uh, is the imperative uh, instantiation pattern uh, via jQuery. It's a pretty common plugin pattern that jQuery uses. Uh, the next one will be more familiar to object-oriented programmers, where we just simply call the constructor with new, and we get a widget. And then we're going to look at four more that are all declarative instantiation patterns. And this is kind of more of a modern take on JavaScript development. Um, especially the way we initialize widgets. So the way I'm going to do this is we're actually going to instantiate the same widget six times. And this is a slider widget. It's a Kendo UI slider widget. And, and all you're seeing here is that widget, but this result is actually a separate part of the DOM. And the reason I did this is because we're going to talk about what happens when I change the value of that slider and how it affects another part of the DOM. Um, a lot of my code examples, again, these are editable for you guys because you now have the slides. Um, a lot of my code examples are in JS Fiddle. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with JS Fiddle, so you kind of understand uh, where this code is, I've, is coming from, I've already I included Kendo UI, the CSS and the JavaScript. Um, and really what you're seeing is the HTML and the JavaScript and the CSS and the output. So hopefully that's not too mystical to anybody. 
Is that why you use JS Fiddle for that visualization? Yeah, and so that you guys can go and get on the web and, and play with this. It's not static, if that makes sense. So we're gonna start with the imperative instantiation uh, jQuery plugin pattern. And this is pretty simple. If you've seen Kendo UI before, right, and you've used jQuery, um, we're just gonna select an input out of the DOM, and the DOM's up here. Then we're gonna call Kendo slider. We're gonna pass Kendo slider some options to configure our slider. And then we get a slider, right, as soon as the browser or whatever web platform you're on parses this, it creates this slider. Now, I'm passing this, this widget a change option, and this is a callback function that's just simply saying, every time this slider changes, go grab the span in the HTML and change it to the value of the slider. So this is how results is updating right now and, and keeping in sync. <coughs> Hopefully, who, who here has written a jQuery or implemented a jQuery plugin? Is that pretty con like, does that pattern look familiar? Okay, good. So, a lot of people um, implement jQuery plugins, but when we start getting to applications and dealing with uh, jQuery plugins, the question becomes, after we instantiate them, how do we then do something with them uh, from a method or an event perspective? And when you, when you write a jQuery, uh, when you implement a Kendo UI widget in a jQuery pattern, we have to actually go and actually get the instance out of the DOM. And so that's why you see me here saying slider.get Kendo slider. Uh, when you implement it using the jQuery pattern, you don't actually get the widget instant, instance back, you get an instance of jQuery. And this is to follow the jQuery chaining pattern, so you can keep chaining jQuery methods. So, of course, if I run this, I'm gonna get an alert. Um, but the thing I want you to key in here is I had to call get kendo slider to get the actual instance of the slider, and then I'm calling value, which is a slider method. And some of you might balk at my alert, but I actually, alerts are like retro now, I think. They're coming back. <laughs> They're gonna be cool again. Okay. Now, I like to call this the object-oriented sacred cow pattern, and that's because a lot of people hate jQuery. I don't know why. It's <laughs> it does a great job of abstracting the DOM, but some people just don't wanna write jQuery code. So it is possible, right? It is possible to go into the Kendo UI code and just call the constructor function that creates the slider. This is still an, an imperative pattern. Um, we're still creating the same exact thing. But because I'm not using jQuery, I actually get an instance immediately back. So my slider variable there actually holds the instance instead of returning jQuery object, right? So, you, and the point of, of this particular code is to say, while Kendo has a hard dependency on jQuery, if for whatever reason you don't want to write the jQuery way, you don't have to. Does that make sense? Okay. So now we're gonna to move to declarative instantiation. So imperative declarative, are those mystical words to anybody? Would anybody raise their hands if it was? <laughs> yeah, so loosely, when, with the first two examples we talked about, it, they're imperative in the sense that we told through JavaScript exactly what we wanted to happen. Now this is gonna, we're gonna to move to, to declarative patterns where we describe what we want to happen. It's a really loose way of putting it. Um, so the first declarative pattern that we're going to look at, uh, and I actually, any bootstrap users in the room? Okay. I actually think this pattern was made popular by bootstrap. It was this concept that uh, in bootstrap they have a, a couple of JavaScript widgets, and the way that they would instantiate those is they wanted uh, bootstrap users to describe what they wanted to happen in the HTML, 
And then JavaScript would go back through the DOM and, and instantiate all of those bootstrap widgets. Well, you can do the same thing uh, with Kendo. Essentially, we're describing in this input, we're passing the configuration options to create this slider. And all I'm doing is using this Kendo init, and I'm telling it, grab the, the body element in the DOM, and anything, any child DOM nodes contained in that body element, I want you to implement widgets when you find data roll. And I'm saying data roll slider here. So when I call Kendo initiate, it goes through and it instantiates all these things. This is a very declarative way of writing your code. Now, the first thing I want to point out about, yeah, go ahead. Uh, just uh, somewhere along the way, are you going to point out, say, pros and cons of different approaches, personal preferences, or does it, well, you know, what does it come down to in terms of your choice? Yeah, when I, when I get to the end of this, I'd okay. be happy to answer that question. Okay. Cool. Um, one thing I want to point out about imperative versus declarative is declarative always leads to imperative, right? Just because I can describe how I want something to occur doesn't mean once I want to do something with it, I'm not forced back into JavaScript in order to do it. Does that make sense? I think some people get enamored with declarative markup. And they think, I can just spend my time in my HTML. But really, in this example, I've described how I want a slider to be created. But now I want to do something with the slider, right? I've got to call methods, or there's events I want to attach to it. I still have to go into the DOM, get its instance using JavaScript in an imperative way, and do something with it, right? So when I run this code again, I uncommented this alert. But I still had to go get the instance, and I still had to call the value method. It's an imperative way of writing something. OK. Yeah? Uh, what do you call get kendo slider as opposed to accessing the data attribute, which I see throughout your documentation? Um, preference. Okay. Two different ways to do it. Okay. My, I, this, I, it's easier, this is easier to read in my brain than to, to show somebody the data and for them to question what's the data method, then explain, explain to the jQuery data method. And it, it just is a more um, clear way, I think, to say you're getting an instance. So, yeah. So Kendo init document body, Kendo wants to look for something that has an input with a data role, yep. a keyword, yep. so that's the reserve, well, for the lack of a better term. Right? Yeah, anything with a data role, um, it will find, and then it will it will decipher the string at value of that attribute, mm -hmm. and and instantiate a slider widget. So, yeah, so. so keep this pattern in mind. We're going to look at three more, and these are variations, right? Now, I I think that in some way Backbone, if anybody here is familiar with the Backbone JavaScript library, I think Backbone made this a little popular. And I'm kind of coming at this in a different direction, but they made views popular. They brought sort of the jQuery developer into the world of views. And all that's going on here is instead of having my view in, in plain HTML, right, I, I have this template-like string of HTML in this script tag. You see I've highlighted it here. Then of course I have a div for my view. And all I'm doing here is, is creating a new view using new Kendo view. I tell it the ID of the HTML string that I want. It creates that. And the reason I kind of uh, say this is a backbone-like pattern is, it, is that as soon as we render that view into the DOM, that widget gets instantiated again. It's very much declarative, like the example we just looked at. And of course, I'm, I, I've got the same problem, right? I want to call methods on that slider now. So I have to go, and I have to get an instance of it out of the DOM, and I want to call the value method. So again, I have to go back to imperative. Uh, the one thing I will 
Uh, mention here is that you'll notice I have to describe this data change event. I describe that in the HTML, but the function actually lives in the global scope. So another, another thing that's a little different when you go the declarative way. So the next pattern we're going to look at, um, declarative instantiation, sort of using the bind or the MVVM pattern. How many people are familiar with the MVVM pattern? OK. Great. So this, this is very much like the bootstrap backbone sort of patterns that we've been looking at, except I want to bind a view model to, I want to take my view, I want to take my data, using a view model, I want to bind those things together. So we can do this in a very similar way where I have a view, I have an input, I still use data role, but now what I'm doing is I'm using these data bind attributes. And if I take the value and tell it from my view model to bind it to that slider, and then I use this text bind without adding any event code, I've now, I've now bound those two-way binding, those, those values together. So this is another way we can instantiate a Kendo slider. Does that make sense to everybody? This, so I, I think this was made popular by Knockout. If there's any Knockout developers, right? Again, I have to go back to imperative programming to actually call a method, though. So, Angular developers. Any Angular developers in the room? Okay, cool. So all of the all of the Kendo UI widgets come with Angular directives. That means that in your Angular controller, if you inject Kendo directives, instead of using our data role, you can just now use Kendo slider. And in your Angular apps, in an Angular way, we declaratively instantiate sliders. And of course, we've got binding, so if I bind this result variable, that means I can use it here in my HTML. So this is very similar to the MVVM pattern. Same exact outcome. So Ed up here had a question of, which do I prefer, which is best? This is a very subjective question in my mind. Um, which is best is whichever works for your brain. There's six patterns there. Um, my brain, personally, I, I gravitate towards imperative. And the reason that is is because no matter what, I always have to go back to imperative programming. Even if I choose to do de declarative, I have to go back to imperative. So does that help answer your question? And I choose imperative because I always end up in imperative. It's not which one's best, just more of the like pros and cons. So if you head down that road, you know, what does it lead to good things or potentially bad things? You know? Yeah, it's such a hard it's such a hard question to answer because as somebody who was a lead engineer for a long time, I would do different things depending upon the group of developers I was working with. I think that declarative for uh, junior developers can be a good stepping stone. And I think as you start dealing with more advanced JavaScript developers, then to say to them, stay in the imperative world can be a good thing as well. It, it really depends upon the developers I have. I, and, it, and how that they deal with the, mark, the JavaScript and the markup itself, the, the pluses and minuses are so tied to the skill level of the developer. It's really hard to say. It's it's more logical, I think, when you play them, and it's more mathematical in that sense, imperative. Uh, I that's think that's what it seems like to me, at least. Yeah, the front end world's kind of this strange world where we have a mixture of traditionally trained programmers mixed with people are, who are coming from Mark HTML and CSS, yeah. and so you have a lot of people that fueled something like Angular, very declarative style of, of coding. Um, to popularity because that's what they could understand. And I, and I don't, I don't want to diminish that. I, I think uh, a lot of great developers have used Angular to build really impressive things. 
So, yeah. So just something I would add to the discussion. Um, I, I tend to lean more toward the declarative approach, like an MVVM style. And the reason that I do that is because I find it, 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 it aids with readability and being able to find uh, where I'm describing um, what my controls should look like. We start to get into a, a complex page that has many widgets. Um, now I have to kind of go into the code and try to match up. All right, well, over here I've got my HTML element that I'm trying to target. And over here, I've got a long script where um, I've, I've got to find the the, the, uh, the code that's targeting that element. And what kind of control am I trying to, to shove into there? So that's what I've found personally. Yeah, I, from I mean, from the community, what's going on here is a lot of people don't believe you should mix logic into your HTML. There is a school of people that think no logic should be in my HTML or my template or anything, and. I, I'm not here to pick a side, I'm just, I'm here to sort of show you guys all the ways Kendo UI can work into however your brain works. Okay, so the next part of laying this foundation might seem really elementary to you guys, um, but we're gonna look at how to, now that we know how to instantiate or create a Kendo UI widget, what we're gonna think about is, how do I learn to do something with it? And I, I'm amazed when I'm at conferences or I'm working a booth, how many people um, aren't aware of some of these uh, just simple things to learn how to use widgets. So we're going to look at um, briefly the demos, the docs, and the API docs. Now, the context in which I'm going to do this is an autocomplete widget. I hope most people are familiar with an autocomplete widget. It's a Kendo UI autocomplete widget. But say I've decided I want to instantiate this using the jQuery pattern. Now I've got to figure out what can I do with the thing. And I actually, I actually, um, I actually think we're the best in the industry at learning how to use something that we've created. This is the, one of the demo pages for autocomplete, and there's 14 or 15 demos there. How many people that create widgets create 14 demos alone to show you how to use the widget? I, not very many, in my opinion. You also notice this edit, this example. Each one of our demos actually goes to a JS Fiddle-like UI that allows you to immediately run the code and edit the code. That's for each demo. So this is the perfect way to start learning how to use the widget. Then we go to documentation. You know, six, seven years ago, documented widget frameworks was sort of a dream. Not many people documented. And even today, this oddly somewhat is an issue. But with Kendo UI, if you go into our docs, you get seven, 10, eight pages of docs for each, each individual widget. So you should be reading these docs when you start thinking about using a widget. Next, we're gonna move to the API docs. So our documentation on how to use a widget is separate from our API docs. This again, I think, is unique, believe it or not. Um, we actually describe each individual API portion of the widget separate from how you actually use the widget in the docs. And the thing I'm gonna focus on here is um, this menu across the top here that says configuration fields, methods, and events. Each widget has a set of options. In our docs, they call them configurations. In the jQuery world, we call them options. We list them out, we tell you how to use them. Now very specifically, right, I'm talking about the values, the properties and values that you send when you instantiate the widget. Each one of those are documented. Fields or static properties. For every widget, we tell you what are the static properties there. So for instance, if we create an autocomplete widget, we get an instance, and I want to go back and I want to get the options that I passed it, there's a static options property on that instance, right? We document all that stuff. They're called fields. Methods. We document all our methods. Again, you saw the value method. I was demonstrating it when we created the slider. Events. These are the events that you can bind to they're broadcasted by the widget. We add callbacks to them. We document each one of them. 
You saw the change, one that I used throughout the examples. Um, now hopefully, that probably was pretty basic, but hopefully that is the foundation. You know how to create a widget, you know how to learn to do something with a widget. Hopefully I've imparted rainbows of can do UI goodness into your head, <laughs> and we can move on. Um, if I haven't, I actually wrote, I'm in the middle of writing a book that covers everything I've just talked about in more detail. But it also includes all the why Kendo UI and all the value propositions. So if you ever want to compare us to somebody else, it's a good place to start. If you ever want to look at those instantiation patterns in more detail, you can go here. And a lot of people came in the room, I think after I started, my slides are actually online right now. I'll flip back at the end so you can get this right now, this slide deck. OK. So now we're to the building blocks. And there's only three. I tried to keep this as simple as I could. And the first one is all of the widgets inherit a set of methods. Knowing these methods really means that you're building with Kendo UI widgets. You're really being powerful. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at passing Kendo UI widgets templates, which is another powerful feature. Kendo UI has its own templating engine. So when you take a template and you pass it to a widget, you can do some pretty powerful things. And probably the most powerful thing that you can do with Kendo UI widgets is attach a data source to it. Who here knows what? A, is everybody comfortable with data source abstractions? No? Yeah, OK. So. I'm trying to remember, anybody use Dojo in the past? Yeah, so when Dojo first came out and I was a budding JavaScript application developer, I tried so hard to wrap my head around what a data abstraction was until coming from the jQuery world, I realized that all that a data abstraction is is wrapping sugar or functions around data. The same way that jQuery wraps So we're going to look at these six methods in more detail. Um, anybody want to tell me what pattern I'm using to instantiate this calendar widget? The imperative jQuery pattern, right? I'm selecting something from the DOM. I'm calling calendar widget. Then I'm getting its instance. So then what we get over here, right, is a calendar widget. Pretty simple concept. Now, I've already instantiated this thing. But after the fact, I'm going to go in and use this set options to change the configurations, right? So if I click this options, yeah? Can you move that code up a little bit? It's, there's a lot of heads in the way. Yeah, that screen is a little low. Thank you. Is that better? It is, thank you. Yeah. So when you select them, it makes it less visible. <laughs> Does it? Would you guys prefer the pointer? I, I don't know. It's just maybe. OK. <laughs> Thank you. I can, I can do pointer. Um, so again, I, I don't want jQuery to get in the way here. So this button is just this ops button down here. All I'm doing is adding an event here when I click it. This code runs, which it, cal is my instance. I'm calling the set options method. So if I click this, the options in my calendar change, right? This is a method inherited by all widgets. All of a sudden, my calendar has a max and min limitation. So I'm just showing you this set options method. The next method we're going to look at is bind. And again, this is after the fact. I've already created my widget. So now I'm going in and I'm working with it. So if I call call.bind, and I tell it I want to add a callback function to the change event. 
then this is going to, well, let me bind it. So I've bound this. And now if I go in, you'll see this down here. It went away. <laughs> All this does is bind events. Now if I keep going, I've got a trigger method. And this allows me to trigger those events. Cal.trigger. I've got an unbind method. This allows me to unbind that event. So now, if I select a calendar date, nothing happens. So I, I bound an event, I triggered an event, and then I unbind that event. Methods that are available to all widgets. And we've got a one. Those jQuery folks in the room should be familiar with this. So if I, if I bind this one, I want this event to occur one time and then go away. But if I click again, that event's gone. The one method. Is there two? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. I feel like there was momentarily in jQuery. Um, <coughs> last two methods, destroy and remove. So I'm going to click this destroy button, and we're going to call cal.destroy. But nothing happened. Does anybody want to offer up a guess what actually happened? Sure. Well, I think it was destroyed, but the HTML doesn't reflect that. Great. Exactly. When we say destroy, what we're actually talking about, the reason you want to destroy a widget is so that you don't deal with any memory leaks. In other words, there's a ton of events attached to these widgets. When you want to clean up after yourself, you want to destroy them. That just simply says, remove all the events, clean it up, make sure there's no memory leaks. In order to actually just des destroy it in the sense that we remove it from the screen, we have to go outside of the methods that are provided by Kendo and just use jQuery to remove it. So I'm just calling, sorry those guys in the back, my scroll's done there. I'm just calling empty and remove jQuery methods. So that'll actually remove it. Why does that work after you destroy it? Yeah. Why did what work? Why, why can you call a method on cal after you destroy it? Oh, I'm using, because, because the reference to the instance is still there. It doesn't destroy that. So that even though I've, I've prepared the widget to be removed, it doesn't remove an, an, an actual um, pointer to the, to the widget. I've still got to have a pointer to it to do, to do some other stuff. To, does that make sense? The pointer in memory, in JavaScript memory, doesn't go away. Okay. Um, so I may, it, this, <laughs> see this wrapper property? That gives me basically a pointer to the <coughs> DOM element that's in the DOM that contained the widget. And it remains there, so I can still do stuff with it. And you can call any of the methods. So you can reset the options and it's party on? Uh, you can. It's not recommended. <laughs> Once you destroy something, the intention is, is that you don't try to um, create it again or call any of the methods. Even though s you can do some weird stuff in there. So yeah. That really surprises me, because it seems to be like a jQuery style. JQuery style would delete its wrapper. But, so in the HTML, the wrapper's not there anymore, but you're accessing it through a method that has a, okay. Yep. <laughs> so, you would describe just to remove all the bindings. Mm -hmm. Okay, but why don't you, you say you can't go back to it, you shouldn't, and the act, we need to call remove to remove it. Yes. Um, as soon as you well, call, call call destroy, uh -huh. you're, you've walked down a road you can't turn back on. You might as well remove that DOM, that tree in the DOM. You remove it from the DOM. And then if you want to put it back, then put it back. Why, why can't destroy remove it? I mean, why isn't it set up like that? There are, there are situations in application development where you still potentially want something out of it, potentially. In other words, uh, when, if you think about this logically, the developers of the API did not want to go as far to assume that you want the entire DOM destroyed. 
Does that make sense? But I'm sorry to be there for this yeah. point, but destroy, I mean, can you reuse it? I mean, is there a time when you want to go back to the witch end? Mm -hmm. The, the documentation says don't reuse that DOM. Even though the DOM is not destroyed, don't reuse it. So, okay. It's like dispose of .NET. Yeah. So, uh, the yeah. destroy, uh, does it help for the memory leak issues? Or this is the best approach for the memory leak? Yeah, destroy, the, the exact purpose of it is memory leaks okay. mm -hmm. and events. Yeah. Does the destroy imply an unbind? Yeah, yeah, it goes through and it unbinds everything. Okay. All the events, yeah. Sorry, just one last question. Sure. From my perspective. Um, we popped up the calendar, right? We used it, and then you destroyed it and made it go away. Uh, if you wanted that to be added, like a pop up, would you just start from the beginning again? If you wanted to. If you wanted the calendar widget to, to go back, yeah. we would invoke an instantiation pattern again and add it back to the DOM. Once you call destroy, it's like you said that part of the DOM tree is, do is gone. We don't completely limit you from it. That's why we don't take it out of the DOM. Um, but as far as an instantiation, you're done. You might as well take it back out of the DOM and instantiate again. You can't recover. Maybe the word we're looking for here is you can't recover it once you destroy it. It's destroyed. Yeah. In dot .NET, that would be resurrect. <laughs> I don't think you can resurrect <laughs> There you go. No, I was just wondering if that's a temp, uh, template for handling like a pop up type pick a date to make it go away and then you reinitialize it pop up, you know, pick a date to make it go away kind of pattern? Uh, I, I mean, depending, sure, sure, depending upon where that mod, where that pop up window is or if you mean a module in the page. Because if, obviously, if it's a modal window built in line with JavaScript, you don't have to reinstantiate that widget every time. Okay. So those were methods that all widgets inherit. Hopefully, again, it's. Uh, I know this might seem pretty basic to some of you guys, but understanding those six methods is critical, I think, to using these widgets. So spend some time with those. The next thing we're going to look at are Kendo templates. Now. Uh, I'm going to assume that most people in this room have a general idea of what a template is, and if not, we'll get to that in a sec. But when I say a template, I'm talking about passing HTML as a string to a widget when we instantiate it. And here I'm using Kendo template um, to pass, it. I'm passing Kendo template or Kendo template a string of HTML. It's converting that into a function that gets called when the widget's instantiated. So when I say passing Kendo a Kendo template option, this is what I mean. Hope we're really clear on that. If you're unclear what a template is, it's a pretty simple concept. Uh, it's really just a string, a JavaScript string, that we jam a JavaScript object together with, and we output the properties of that object with variables that are in the string, and we get the values, and it outputs the values. Is everybody comfortable with that? Cool. So in order to demonstrate this, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show a drop-down widget. Now, I'm creating a drop. Does anybody want to tell me what pattern I'm using? It's a theme in my slides. Yeah, there we go. Using the jQuery pattern. So I'm creating a drop-down list here. And when I instantiate this, I'm passing it a data source. It's a very simple array of objects, but I'm passing it a template and a value template. Now, the widget, when it's instantiated, uses these templates and combines it with this data source. So essentially, my options for my dropdown become the URL and name in my data source combined with this image HTML. Does that make sense to everybody? So you can imagine this could be pretty powerful, right? Shoving templates into widgets and having them use them at its instantiation time. Now, since most good JavaScript developers know you shouldn't put templates in your JavaScript, right? Like, who likes writing HTML as a string in JavaScript? <coughs> Not a good idea. If you do this, stop doing it. 
So one of the things that we can do is instead of putting those strings, JavaScript, we can put them in HTML. We can wrap them with script tags. Then we just tell it right, that we want to grab it out of the DOM. <coughs> so hopefully this will still run. And it doesn't. HTML I'm sorry, what did you say? You have to call that HTML method. Sorry, you were right. Um, so in order, I, I'm just highlighting this so, just so that you guys realize as part of Kendo UI library, we intended that the templates aren't in JavaScript. Now, because most people feel like this about their templating engines, um, we sort of respect that, right? Like, we're, I know people feel like this dog about templating engines. So, if you think about what Kendo template does, it just creates a function, just like handlebars, right? So all that I'm doing here is replacing our template engine with handlebars. Same concept, right? I'm, I'm putting my template in the HTML, wrapping it in a script tag, but I'm grabbing the HTML out of the DOM, compiling it, which creates a function that's called when the, when the widget is instantiated. You can use whatever templating engine you want. A lot of the, uh, so a lot of the reason that people use their own templating engine is because a lot of templating engines provide this sort of sugar, sugary like syntax in the template allow you, you to do simple things like loops or um, you know whatever particular engine provides. You kind of see some of that sugar here with these brackets. Now, who here has worked with Kendo <coughs> templates? Anybody? Oh, a couple of people. All right, I'm running out of time, aren't I? I'll move a little quicker. Um, Kendo UI templates, uh, when I first came to them, uh, I was a little thrown off by the fact there's no sugar in them. I was a handlebars guy. Until I realized that using our pound um, tags in a template, I can just write JavaScript. And I'm a JavaScript developer, so I just want to write JavaScript. So as you can see, with this if statement up here, all I'm doing is writing JavaScript, but it's inside the template. I just have to wrap it with pound. Here I put a variable. Oh, and my slides are really dark. I apologize for that. Here's a loop. So the reason, the reason this is done is because our templates go faster than anybody else. There's no sugar. Like this, this is, most templates are like this turtle, but Kendo templates, or like a turtle at skateboard. <laughs> if you don't believe me, go to the documentation. We have, per, we have tests that you can run for yourself. So data source. I'll jam through this, um, even though this is really important. When I'm talking about a data source, I'm talking about creating an instance of the data source. Right? We're going to wrap some sugar around a data set, and then we're going to tell a widget to use that data set. Now, you don't have to create an instance. You saw me do this previously in other code examples where I just passed an array or I passed this object with a data property in an array. You can do this, but you're bypassing a, a data source instance. Here's a really long definition. If you're into long definitions, I'm not going to read this. It's in the docs. But I just really quickly want to show what this means. Here I'm, I'm very simply creating a grid. I'm telling it its columns. I'm passing it an instance of data source. I'm passing it some data. I'm giving it a scheme and a model. Now, because I used a data source here, I have the luxury of being able to update that data source. I'm not calling any methods on the widgets. I'm dealing only with the data source. So when I click Add, just using jQuery to add a click event to this add button, which calls this function you see uh, here at the bottom of the code. And of course, I just updated my data source. That's all I did. 
Does anybody see the magic in what just occurred? So I didn't, I didn't tell the, the grid widget to do anything. I didn't go back into the DOM and call a method. I didn't say, oh, the data source is now updated, so re-render yourself. What do you get by using data source for free? You get, a, in a sense, you get two-way binding. The widget just updated itself just by having a data source. Most people who start with Kendo UI never bark down this road of understanding what data source does. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. This thing is extremely powerful. Does that make sense to everybody? Cool. And this, I mean, what the data source can provide is amazing. With very little code, you can create a, a complex grid where you add complex data. And all of this is dealing only with the data source. It's, it's pretty powerful. So to review, if you're going to get better with Kendo UI, check out the methods that, that all the widgets inherit. Make sure you understand templates. Make sure you understand all the widgets that accept templates and what that means. Choose your own templating engine if you want. Data source, major building block to Kendo UI widgets. Go study data source. It, it really will change the way you think about widgets once you start using them. Um, and I think I'm running behind. So thank you guys. I, I appreciate your time. <laughs> uh, so